What's up, everyone? We're back for part two. Um, if you had listened to part one, this is my new cousin, Christy. She's always going to be a new cousin for the rest of my life. We you know, uh, <laughs> got to know each other. And as we were chatting after we ended the part one, uh, now she has all these other questions to ask, which is good. I told her she has free game to ask questions. So we didn't want to over uh, make the first video over an hour. So now I'm making this part two. So back to you, Christy, you have the mic. Oh man, on the spot. I'm still trying to get my thoughts together on this. Uh, but in part one, we, you know, we talked a lot about therapy and kind of, you know, I asked the question, but, you know, I'd love to dig in more about God being the ultimate therapist. Um, but actually before we get to that again, told you I'm getting my thoughts together on this. Um, you, <laughs> you know what really... it, folks, you know what it is? She doesn't want to say it out like as flat out. She's like, how can I professionally say this? I, no, it's not that I feel like I have to lead into it. Um, so I, you know, a question I would like to ask is, I know you didn't talk about it, but I know this from your book and from other conversations that we've had where medication wasn't for you. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so let me be clear. I'm not against medications. I'm not against surgeries. In fact, um, we grew up very much, everything is medication. And so um, when I went to the VA for all my treatment and I was giving medication for this, I was medicated for that, I wasn't bothered then. I wasn't bothered by the medication that I was given. But I started paying attention to the labels of these medications. And it's, it was always saying like, your liver is at risk, your this mm -hmm. is at risk, and you're then I was like, what, this is just for my knees. Like, what does what? So mm -hmm. I started paying attention to that. But it still did not bother me about how did I become so um, that I believe that you can live a life without medications. Mm -hmm. It started because this is also a great, this is a great question. I don't think I talked about this in my book. It started because I, this was around Christmas. I was already working out. I had lost like 50 pounds. I was in the gym all the time. And this was around the holidays. This was around Christmas time. Mm -hmm. And Christmas time, it was back to back to back drinking, back to back eating, drinking, whatever. But I was still hitting gym. So I wasn't like, oh my God, like I gained, but no, that was good. I... A couple of, like the next day or, or the, the day after that, I could not walk. I like my my knees had locked up so bad I could not walk. I needed a wheelchair. And I was like, whoa, like what's going on, y'all? So I had to go to the emergency room and they had to give me medication for me to unlock my knees. And I'm like, yo, nurse, like, doc, what happened? Like, uh, I didn't do nothing in the gym to hurt myself. I, I didn't fall down the stairs. I didn't do nothing. Like, she was like, well, what kind of week did you have? I was like, well, it was like back to back drinking. <laughs> and she's like, well, that's why. I go, what's why? She's like, alcohol has a lot of inflammation. And I'm like, so, well, why, do, like, she was like, you you have a torn meniscus. I go, yeah, but I didn't suddenly have a torn meniscus. She's like, oh, you must have, you must have always had a torn meniscus. And I'm like, so why suddenly is my knee locked? And that's when she was like, the inflammation is what causes you pain. Mm -hmm. I go, oh, so what are you giving me for? are we having surgery like what are we doing she's like well you have to follow up with your orthopedic to do that but we're going to give you anti-inflammatory medication and that's when I was like wouldn't I just go on an anti-inflammatory diet then that's how that started mm -hmm. that was the birth of my curiosity and so I went on a an anti-inflammatory diet I stopped drinking for a little bit 
I started, I, I gave up all this food that had high, in, like that was high in inflammation. Next thing you know, like I'm getting my knees back. I did not have to take the medication. And that's when I'm like, whoa, what mm -hmm. else can I do without medication? And so when I started, this is, and then when I started running with mm -hmm. my deteriorating ACL that I currently have, my two torn meniscus that I currently have, uh, all this other fun stuff, I started Googling, how can I run without knee pain? And it says, stay away from inflammation and stay away from overusing your legs. Bad. So I started running and it, st it started working. I was able to run three miles without my knee locking. And then <clears throat> for three weeks, it worked until it locked again. And I was so disappointed. I was like, man, I gave up alcohol. I gave up red meat. I was like, what am I missing? And it just so happened because I asked for it. That's what I've been telling y'all. Do you do all be asking? <laughs> do y'all be asking? Because if you ask, you shall receive. And I was like, man, what am I missing? Like I did, I did everything. Like, how am I still, how are my knees still locking? And it just so happened that I ran, when I came home, I was coming up the stairs, my neighbor was coming down and somehow the conversation of gluten came up. I don't know how it came up, but it just came up and she goes, oh yeah. Like I gave up gluten for two years. My body is still so different from the inflammation. I was like, really? Maybe that's what I'm missing. Huh, why not? I'll try it. That's why I became gluten-free for a year. I was able to run 17 miles with no pain. I was able to do all these things. Well, I should say no knee pain. Mm -hmm. I had other areas to work on in my legs that were weak. I was able to do all these things without knee pain. And I was like, and that's why I became sober. Be not because like, oh, I can't drink or it's because of running. It was mm -hmm. like one big trap in my life. I was like, well, if I can stay away from the inflammation, I can do this. If mm -hmm. I can stay away from that, I can do this. And that's why I tell folks, you want to reach greatness? You got to give up something. Right. And But I also have the mentality, Desi, like you were fat and drunk. Like you damaged a lot of your body. So it's not like I sit around and go, oh my God, I can't have this. Like I appreciate that I have a second chance. I appreciate grace. So because I have the conversation with myself, like you were fat and drunk, like you did a lot, you did a lot of damage, girl. Like you have to be, so I don't sit around and go, oh man, I can't, no, 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 no. Be a, like, be a grown up. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to give up one thing in order to do the thing I love. It's a win-win for me. If you look at it as a win-win, absolutely. But too many times I have the conversation with people like, oh, I, I can't, like, my knee hurts. I'm like, listen, like, this is what I did. Like, oh, yeah, I, I, I did. I ate a salad. Good Lord. So what happens is when people have the mentality that they have to give up something, they want to know why they are giving it up right now. Mm -hmm. So they're like, if I'm giving up my favorite cookies mm -hmm. that I want everything to work out in my favor right now and so there's this instant gratification that must take place because they're leaving something comfortable right they don't work that way so that's how and that's why I believe that you can live a life without medications through transparency transformation okay so you talked about the physical side what about the mental side the mental side is. Were you offered medications when you were? No, I just said no. Okay. No, no. When I got, when I got taken to the night where all this stuff went down for why mm -hmm. I was sectioned, why, why I was sectioned, mm -hmm. a friend of mine took me to the hospital and I was like, holy shit, how do I get out of here? Because I know. I know they're about to like lock me up and I know they're about to like put me through all this stuff and I'm not like, I just had a feeling that this was not it. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to look for an escape and my friend <laughs> snitched on me. She's like, she's trying to look for an escape. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't get mad at her for that because it was true. Mm -hmm. So they gave me this medication that I was so high 
And all I do, all I remember was that I woke up, I was in the ambulance and I woke up in the psychiatric ward ward and they had to like tap me in my face to wake me up just to ask me for my name. I was like, holy shit. This Did they uh, give you this medication? Yeah. Okay. And I was like, I ain't taking that shit again. <laughs> was it like extra dose of Xanax or something? I don't know what it was, but it was, I never felt so high in my life. So I was like, so when we were, yeah, they had offered me medications. In fact, that's when I started getting really irritated with medication. I think that's where my my stance of no i'm not telling you it's not like a form of rebellion it's more like a i don't have to i don't mm-hmm. have to if i don't have to do that if i do this mm-hmm. but if i choose to keep doing this yes i need to accept this mm-hmm. and so many times people want to do this they want to hold on to one thing and don't reach for the help mm-hmm. because their stubbornness is like oh no like I can do it alone. Mm-hmm. Bitch, no, you can't do shit alone. Like, stop acting like all you need is determination. Like, no, we need help. Mm-hmm. Our determination is to keep us going forward. And so I was willing to be very transparent, let my pride and ego hurt so that I did not need medication. A lot of people want to keep their pride and ego and refuse medication. Mm-hmm. So they wonder why they're not doing well. So share with everyone what you were diagnosed with at the time that they were trying to treat you with medication. Uh, PTSD, major depressive disorder, I, uh, suicidal ideal, ideation, um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, the other one was, um, that's like the, uh, what's the other word for loneliness? Um, not, they didn't put the word loneliness. Pretty much I was like a, a loner, like a self. Uh, Isolation? I, yes. Yeah, so, so isolated something. Okay. Um, that with a lot of physical stuff. Okay. So, you know, I, th- I feel like out of all this, the most serious one is the suicidal ideation, which is becoming more and more common t- in today's society. Can you share more about what you were feeling with that and what you feel? And I'm sure by now you've peeled that onion as to the why, uh, what led you yes. there? So the, the root and the problem is pride and ego. That um, led you to the suicidal ideation? It is the reason why. Okay. Um, a lot of people, so our root of not letting go and asking for help is because we're too pride to ask for help. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people probably won't agree, but it's not like I, I, I visited, Mm -hmm. I went there. And so in order to survive that mentality, you're either going the other way for the rest of your life and never coming back, or you become desperate and ask for help knowing that you have to give up the thing that took you down. Mm-hmm. I always say pride is like carrying a shovel that you keep digging yourself a hole in. Mm-hmm. And the only way to stop digging yourself a hole is to literally let go of the shovel. Mm-hmm. The thing that's giving you a bigger hole every single time. Mm-hmm. And so we have this understanding that it is my way, the only way, and I just need luck to give me a different outcome, or I just need some to meet the right person, or I just need to, to get it, make it big this one time. Mm -hmm. So we lean on this understanding of our own, almost our own, like, I have the answers. I just need them to work. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's almost, it's killing us. Mm -hmm. And we fall into this depression. We have anxiety because it's not working. Mm-hmm. And we fall into this pit of, I don't even know what I want in life no more. Mm-hmm. Okay. And and I, I dig into this because there's people around me that have also had suicidal ideation, but it's hard for me to understand having never 
Because it's, embar- it's embarrassing for, pe- for people to have a conversation about it. No one wants to say like, oh, the thing that really drug me down was, I mean, it's, yes, it's depression, but depression leads into one thing and it, and it carries something else and it carries something else. But like <laughs> the best example to, to say you win is like having this 500 pound guy on top of me and I'm like, Damn, and only and the only way for me to get back up is to ask for help, is to say like to get off me. But if I'm too prideful to ask for help, I'm just gonna die underneath there and like, oh, don't move. I'll just mm-hmm. I don't I don't I don't need you. I don't need nobody. Pride and ego. It is the root like like it it whoops our ass, and mm-hmm. yet we're like, oh no, that's not it. Mm-hmm. So was it as easy as flipping a switch and saying, all right, pride and ego, go away? So I started recognizing how powerful my pride and ego was when I started identifying that that was my problem. Um, Yeah, we can go to the layers of why, but I went straight to the root and I started I started calling out why I started it started growing. And so when I had asked God, how do I get rid of my pride and ego? Oh, 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 man. I, till this day, I remembered the event of the, of my life that I had to confront in order to starve the Buddha that I had created, the Buddha that I had fed. Now you have to understand, like, personally, I don't think pride leaves overnight. I think mm-hmm. pride is something that you feed. Mm-hmm. And in order to overcome this pride and ego that you have fed for so many years, you have to starve it. It's almost kind of like fasting. Like it's like a keto diet. All of a sudden you get rid of carbs and all of a sudden you're losing weight. You're like, holy shit. It's the same thing, like not feeding this this Buddha that I was feed, like that I was feeding. And the events that day, I I swear to God, I still remember their faces because of how it affected me. Mm -hmm. Not that anything that they did wrong. It was because everything that I used to feed and I had to make a different decision and choice in order to respond differently than I used to affected me. It wasn't. It was my response, my reaction that fed my Buddha. A different response and reaction starved my Buddha. If that makes sense. Okay. Like, for example, I used to be a person that if I was wrong, I'll be like, oh, no. Like, oh, I will, n- I will never admit, I'll never admit that. And now I don't care if I'm wrong. I don't care if I'm proven wrong. I don't care if I'm right. I don't care if I'm wrong. It's not about being right. It's not about being wrong. And that took, like, for me to say that, that is a miracle. Mm-hmm. I love when God proves me wrong. Oh, I love it. I'm like, yes, this is what it would, this is, this is worth it. Mm-hmm. But if I still had pride and ego, my reaction would be different. How, my response will be different. It's because my, my heart is in the right place finally. And so to going back of this suicide ideation, like I love my life now. I love mm-hmm. my life because there's nothing to prove. Mm-hmm. And so too many times we have this need to prove this need for validation, but I dare you to ask yourself why mm-hmm. and keep digging why you're, you're going to find a, some root of pride and ego there. Like, like you deserve this. I deserve this. And I deserve that. I worked hard for this. And I, and it's like, it'll come out. So. Who were you looking for validation from? So it really hit me when I got out of the military, really hit me because I had no identity. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted a career so bad and no one would hire me. Not even Dunkin' Donuts. Like, I was applying to, for janitorial positions at this point. And um, I was like, holy shit, this sucks. 
And so I was like, I can't even be hired as a janitor for Dunkin' Donuts. Like, come on now. And so I was so desperate because I knew my unemployment was going to like run out any day now. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, how like I had to keep up with the lifestyle that I was living. I had to keep up with the image that I was living. And so it just it was a miracle that like how I ended up where I'm at now. Like it, it that humbled me. <laughs> mm-hmm. That humbled me because whew. so. I don't think, I think you will always be tested. And when it comes down to your pride ego, I, I still am mm-hmm. to this day. Um, I loved big numbers. I loved big everything. And so when I had to do the camp and my assignment, my instructions were to do the camp for free, that was a, a big eye opener, especially knowing what kind of hustler that I love being. I love chasing money i love everything to do with money and now that i was broke you want me look you want me to do this stuff for free (laughs) you're right you sure like but it is the most remarkable thing i have learned doing something for free it is incredible i think if anyone has the opportunity to do it that you can see what i can see doing something for free so it was a genius plan and um the the fact that I have held events where no one has showed up to. And I was like, you want me to do what? Like, why did you want me to do this for? To kill my pride and ego. Um, in fact, I'm doing a, an event this Saturday. And I was hoping that it'll be this big event. And I'm like, it's kind of like crickets. And I'm like, <laughs> and so it's, we go back to the question. Are you doing this because I told you to? Or are you still looking for approval of man? I was like, mm-hmm you're right so i'm still tested i'm still like to see like if i can be trusted Mm -hmm. still even as things are getting better and increasing i'm still every every single time i want you to do this i want you to do here i have competed in bodybuilding 10 times and placed last 10 times (laughs) That doesn't hurt your ego. I don't know what does. I was like, wow, like you want me to be in a sport that I suck at? Like, wow, let's like just say you hate me. All right. Like just <laughs> and then I realized I realized like it was pretty much was it to follow your instructions or was it to prove a point? And you're like, wow, man, like, and so. But with the bodybuilding, I've learned so much about myself and I gained so much confidence that I never thought was possible. And here I am looking for the placement. And what it really did was change my life overall. So I still get tested. Good to know. So even when you feel like you've reached that place, you're still going to, it's, there's not really an end, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. I don't think it's. I don't think it's for, it's not for, I really don't think it's not for God. It's to protect us Mm -hmm. so that we don't, as we do become bigger and bigger and bigger, that we don't eventually become recruited. Like one of the things that I understood very importantly is like, do not get recruited. And what I mean by recruit is that too many times, like we start off with an intention and purpose, but somewhere along the way, either a disappointment or our, our pride and ego did sneak in or we started getting tired or we didn't expect it to be like this. And somehow we get, we, we become recruited like everyone else does. And then something, then suddenly we just lose the intention of why we were there in the first place. And so if one thing I have learned, becoming mm-hmm. a nonprofit, becoming a not a nonprofit and doing it for free I have learned to stood and what I believe in with everything I got because that's all I have like I have no one to impress I have no one to make sure that I don't say nothing that to lose their funding 
I don't have or meet anyone that um that I might disappoint. Like the mental health, you're gonna to have to say things that are not comfortable. You're gonna to have to peel things and say things that are hard. Mm-hmm. You have to give up people pleasing in order to become effective. Mm-hmm. It's hard. Like I had to say something the other day and I'm still like, man, that was hard. And yet I still have to make sure that the effectiveness is still more important than my what pleases me. Mm-hmm. And that's hard. And so that's what being a not a nonprofit and doing it for free has showed me where I really stand in this and what and what I believe in. Do you ever um, come across people that are in a state of depression that just seem to like to be there? Yes. Um, one of the things that they can recognize in me mm-hmm. is that I live it. What do you mean by that? It's easy to preach it. It's mm-hmm. harder to live it. They see me mm-hmm. and they see that I live it. I just don't preach it. I just don't write about it. I live it. And so from someone that has gone through, it's hard for to people that are new or people that didn't know me before. It's hard for them to see how I used to be. And it's because, like I tell folks, I don't look like I went through smoke. And that's a compliment. It's a compliment when you look at me and you don't believe my past. It's a compliment. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. used to irritate me because I'm like, bitch, you know what I went through? It's a compliment. I'm, <laughs> I'm taking it as a compliment right now. So, <laughs> But no, I just re- learned in order to keep them and in order for them to make people believers, all I have to do is just live it. And that's not hard for me to do. It's not like I have a double life. I'm like, oh shit, I gotta here, I gotta get off work. Mm-hmm. I gotta become someone else. Like who you see now is who you get. Like whether I'm in church or I'm in camp or like who you see is who you get. Now with you, you know, there were life events that kind of led you to the situation of uh, depression and isolate the isolation uh, diagnosis and the um, suicidal ideation. Uh, What about others that seem to be born with mental illness, like bipolar disease? Um, Do you also believe that there are ways through God that you can work yourself out of that without relying on medication? So without saying where I work at, um, I have sat in many interviews where I have been part of many, I'm talking hundreds of conversations for many years, probably thousands at this point, where the parents almost go shopping for these kids diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the saddest thing to witness. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand that at one point um, before this is who you see, I wasn't, I worked. Oh, one second. Hold on. (laughs) Sorry, I, I had something cooking. I was like, Oh, geez. Man, I was like, what's that smell? Sorry, guys. Hope you didn't burn dinner. No. So um, I think it's so. I think that's the saddest thing to see. Mm-hmm. And. Um, and it's not nothing like a here and there interview. This is mm-hmm. all the time. And so. The. When I first started working, 
working where I work at, I was miserable. Like I wasn't miserable, but I was almost 300 pounds. And so when I was at the verge of, I can't do this no more. You have to understand how hard it was listening to people tell me what they can't do eight hours a day, five hour, five days a week. And I'm like, maybe I can't do it either. Maybe they're right. And to pull away from that and continue to hear it while I'm trying to find strength to stand tall and overcome these things and still hear it eight hours a day, five days a week. And so those that have been told Mm -hmm. or diagnosed, I would challenge you to find out who you really are. Okay. You could diagnose me all you want. That's not who the fuck I am. So I would challenge you if you were told that this is how I am, this is, it's it's written in my medical records, me too, but that's not who the fuck I am. I refuse to live like that. And so if you had one of those parents that went shopping for your diagnosis, that's not who the fuck you are. Okay, then. And that the, that was the thing that you know I really wanted to lead to is more a lot on mental illness um you know feel like it's become I hate to say it almost the popular thing it is no I'll say it if you don't want to say it yeah it is we sometimes mix in insecurities Mm -hmm. and mental health right so instead of saying like wow I'm I'm very insecure then we all of we right away diagnose it with with something mm-hmm. instead of instead of labeling like what it really is, we're avoiding that emotion and slapping a mental health diagnosis instead, mm-hmm. and that's dangerous. And so I, I've seen it so many times. And there was this one situation where just someone that came to my facility and I was like they're trying to shove this diagnose down his throat. I'm like, this chick is spoiled, okay? (laughs) She's spoiled. She wants her way all the time. You guys are still feeding and enabling the spoiliness, but instead of saying that, because you know, how you don't want to say that, it's this person suffers from such and such. Mm -hmm. So, that is happening a lot too and it's it's becoming um dangerous if you ask me so let me tell you a story real quick because they're about seven eight, seven years ago or it's probably this is probably six years ago i was um there was a retreat through the church i was attending that i had attended seven years ago and then um, like six months later, I was actually serving on team for it. And there was an individual there who suffered from mental illness. And this wasn't like depression or bipolar. This was like someone. And I think she actually, you know, did was in and off this in and out of the street, living on the street sometimes. And it was a challenge for us because we didn't know what to do. I mean, so in like that type of level of mental illness, you know, are those things that you can work with someone through, through God, um, through prayer, or are those things that, you know, sometimes you do have to just rely on medication. Sometimes some people just need a conversation. Um, if you saw my post the other day, I, one of the things that we do every Sunday is we go out on the streets and we serve soup and sandwiches. Mm-hmm. I don't post it. I don't talk about it because one of the most annoying things is when people do things with the camera, like, hey, look what I'm doing. Like my post. 
and pat me in the back for being a good person. I don't mm -hmm. do that. I can give two shits about the pats in the back. But when I'm there and doing it and show my intention, my purpose, I want to learn people's names. Mm -hmm. I want to know what your name is. I'm not trying to shove Jesus down your throat. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're just there. You hungry, dog? You want some soup? And I know I have learned people's names. Mm -hmm. And I have, have conversations and we just talk. And so that's all. That's all I'm there. And people respect that and enjoy that you remember who they were or who they are just by remembering their name. Mm -hmm. And so if they, if they want prayer, like, Hey, you want a prayer? Like, yeah, can you pray for me? All right, no problem. So it's. Sometimes we, a conversation and a prayer. I, I'm going to, I'm going to say this. I don't know how much mental health. Oh man. Like it's a really sensitive, it's not a, in a bad way it's a very special sensitive topic for me mm -hmm. because i'm very very dive deep into it and one of the things i have learned is that if in order for us to understand mental health we should understand cultures understand environments mm -hmm. understand people's backgrounds one of the first two questions i was asked in every one of my therapy sessions and these meetings i go to what is your religion and what is your culture? It's the first two questions that they ask. And it's the most important question because you'll learn everything about them in those two questions. Interesting. And another thing is like, what is their top five priorities in their life? A lot of it is family. Mm -hmm. So if they cannot get their family approval, they feel rejected. The root of a lot of things that you see in the streets is a root of rejection. They feel mm -hmm. rejected. And then something that root of rejection leads to this, it leads to that, it leads to this, and leads to that. The conversation I had in my camp, they're talking like, oh, like, how are you insensitive to my mental health? I go, as adults, we have a responsibility to recognize that sometimes our choices and our ways has led us into this, then led us into that, and then led us into this. If we keep denying that our choices have opened up these doors, we're always going to blame something and someone in our life. Mm -hmm. Always. And then next thing you know, we're hurting other people because of the choices that we have made and now we're in denial of. And so sometimes some people just need conversations. Mm -hmm. Do you know out of the 10, uh, 10 grown folks that I coach, only one parent shows up for their events. Oh, wow. One. And, and here's the thing. Do you know I've not met, besides that parent and the other parent, because I go to the church, I have not met no one else's parents. Not, not because I'm looking for something from you. Mm -hmm. But I do recall when I was going to a Christian church, right, back in the 90s, and my dad was curious to know who made an impact in my life. He's Catholic. Mm -hmm. He brought flowers to my pastor during service. Let's see. So I don't need flowers or a pat it back, but your kid needs to see that mm -hmm. you give a fuck. Yeah. Period. So the mental health thing. I would check at home. We so, can blame a lot of society, but right. I would check at home first. So to, to wrap things up, um, you know, I want to know five years ago, what were your top five priorities and what are your top five priorities today? Money, money, money. <laughs> that is five years ago. <laughs> Let's see. What year was that? 22, 21, 20, 19, 18. Oh, yeah. I was money. still. Yeah, I was still 300 pounds. Well, I had, uh, I was trying to invest into some things and I, I was drinking a, that's when I was drinking a bottle a day, a liter of Coke and fast food three times a day. So as much as I was spending money, I was also trying to make that much money. Okay. So, yeah. So top five was all money or money, alcohol, food. money, 
Um, how can I be successful? Okay. How can I be rich? How can I make it rich? Like that, that, that type of mentality. <laughs> but what about today? Today, my number one thing is what is my next instruction? Okay. Number, actually, I take that back. Number one is to understand what my intention is every single day. I understood that, I understand that in order for me to follow my instructions well, I have to make sure my intentions are good. I have to make sure that it's never about me and that I'm still pure with my intentions. Every single, like I have to. So if I can understand where my intentions are at, I can understand how to follow my instructions. So intention is one, instructions is number two. Number three is growing. Okay. Like, how how can I grow? Like, what more can I do? Mm -hmm. and it's not so much like what, how much, how much more can I do? It's how much more can I do? What am I truly capable of? Mm -hmm. That's what I want to find out. Okay. And number four, it is. I think that's those are my top threes. Daniel. I mean, yeah. Uh, wanna, no, I'm just giving you. <laughs> I mean, if you want to include like my team, like that, yeah. to me, that is part of my intention. Like right. they are part of my intentions. Like the reason why, if you ask me, like the if the reason why I study my intentions so much is because I have lives in my hands. Mm -hmm. I I can't imagine. I've become so selfish that I, I take it out on them. I, I don't even know how people do that. It, I know people that do that. It got done to me. But I, I can't even imagine what heart you needed to be okay with becoming selfish. Like, I can't even imagine what your heart looks like in order for you to be okay becoming selfish. That yeah. blows my mind. And so I want to make sure that I never reach that peak even yeah. if it hurts me because mm -hmm. I have lives in my hands. Yeah. So they're part of my intention. That's awesome. Yeah. Cause it's, it's hard. I mean, I think a lot of times when people are selfish, they don't realize they're being selfish. And so that's why. No, no, they do. No, no, okay. no they do. <laughs> they no. do. Okay. Because you want me to tell you why? Here, I'll mm -hmm. go there. You need energy. You need energy to become selfish in order to feed your pride and ego. You mm -hmm. need energy from somewhere, someplace, okay? And so in order to become selfish and survive, mm -hmm. you have to have this, like, um, like, you're, like, you have to have this energy of how much you can screw people over. That mm -hmm. is what drives you. That is your energy. Because eventually you get tired. So you have to ask yourself this, this question every single day. What keeps your foot on the pedal? everyone has to answer that right like what keeps your foot on the pedal mine is, is intention mm -hmm. the intention to make sure that i'm in position at all times to hear loud and clear from my next instruction because i have lives in my hands that's what keeps my foot on the pedal people that that are selfish they're like okay so where can i get it from because mm -hmm. my intention is connected to source. So when your intention is connected to source, source gives you energy to go forward, to keep your foot on the pedal. So where does your energy come from? It has to come from somewhere if it does not come from source. Right. And then, yeah, I know. <laughs> if it's not there, then you should question if you're on the right path. Exactly. So you, the number one question you should be asking is, where is my energy coming from? Yeah. Good, good last thoughts there. Anything else you'd like to add? Oh, not, um, not this, not this part two, maybe another part two, the part three. Part three. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad we got to touch on mental illness in this part two. Um, I think it's, it's very important for a lot of people out there, whether it's affected them personally, 
um, or someone close to them. You know, I think it's, it's always good to understand uh, where they're coming from and, you know, may, maybe how you overcome that. Yes, indeed. And I, I would encourage you to always keep digging. You'll find your answer. If you're, if you are purposely looking for an answer, mm-hmm. I can promise you, you're not going to like the answer. I, let me just say that for you. Right, <laughs> Let me just say it for you right now. You're not going to like the answer. However, if you're open for the answer, you will get your answer. Thank you for that. Sometimes I need that reminder too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Zenaida, it was such a pleasure. I um, look forward to doing this again soon. Thanks, new cousin. Thank <laughs> Anytime, you for new cousin. The question. Absolutely. Talk to you later.